Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Winter Science Series speaker, speaker series talks um, hosted by the Mariah Mitchell Association and featuring former Mariah Mitchell interns. I am Dr. Regina Jorgensen, the Director of Astronomy here at the MMA, and I'd like to thank you all for tuning in tonight. Um, the MMA is a nonprofit organization dedicated to memorializing the legacy of America's first woman astronomer, Mariah Mitchell. And I'd like to start off tonight by thanking our sponsors for the event, which include Bank of America, TMT, the 30 meter telescope, the White Elephant and Cisco Brewers. And tonight is actually the last in our winter science speaker series. Um, we will be doing a summer series. So I'll just encourage you to look out for that. Um, and before we begin, uh, even though everybody's very used to the Zoom world now, I'll just make a note on um, how we'll run the program tonight. Um, I would highly encourage you to ask questions. Um, please use the Q&A function, which you should find um, kind of on the bottom of your screen, and we will have time at the end of the talk tonight to answer questions. So I strongly encourage you to um, put any questions that you might have in the Q&A, and we'll take questions at the end. And so now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Meg Lysett Thatcher. Um, and Meg was actually a Mariah Mitchell Association astronomy intern in the summer of 1986, when students added to the observatory plate collection and studied variable stars. Um, so this is a very cool uh, time period um, at Mariah Mitchell. And I have just been really, um, uh, blessed and lucky to be in contact with Meg again and to hear about that time um, and that history of the Mariah Mitchell Association. Um, so her uh, very first publication came out of that internship and it was titled Updated Elements for IY Cygni in the Winter 1986 Journal of the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And after graduating from Carleton College, she went on to use her photographic plate skills as an intern at the AAVSO and then got a master's degree um, from Iowa State University. She is currently the senior laboratory instructor for Smith's College Astronomy Department and the academic director for Smith's Summer Science and Engineering Program and a children's book writer. She has written 30 articles for kids, nonfiction magazines, and three books. And her book, Sky Gazing, A Guide to the Moon, Sun, Planets, Stars, Eclipses, Constellations, received a starred review in the School Library Journal and is the winner of a Nautilus Silver Award and the 2022 AAAS Subaru Prize for Excellence in Children's Science Books. And so with that, I'd just like to say I'm really um, thankful that you were able to join us tonight, Meg, and tell us a little bit about your book and about what you've been up to in the intervening years since you left Mariah Mitchell. And um, I'm really looking forward to tonight's talk. So thank you so much. And I will um, turn it over to you now. Uh, let me stop my screen share. All right, and I will start my screen share. You just basically, Regina just did my first five slides, um, which is great because I'm sure that this talk was gonna go over anyway. So, <laughs> well, we would we would like to hear you you speak about them. So I will go ahead and mute. Well, I will. I will. I will. Will re uh, reiterate uh, half the stuff that that Regina said, and and that's a really daunting task trying to um, uh, sort of encapsulate the time since I was a, a Mariah Mitchell Observatory intern because. That was 36 years ago. So a lot has happened since then. <laughs> so uh, let me get started here. All right, there we go. So as Regina said, I am the senior laboratory instructor at Smith College in Northampton, which is in the Western part of Massachusetts. And uh, this is my observatory now. Uh, we just had a, that. Um, probably five to 10 years ago, we had a dome put on the top of our roof. It was very exciting. So it's, it's you know, the, the students can just zip up to the roof and, and uh, do their work there, which is nice. Uh, in addition to that, I'm the academic director of the Summer Science and Engineering Program, which is one of five academic camps that Smith offers for high school girls. Uh, and 
Just FYI, as you can see, there's a little apply to pre-college programs button there down at the bottom. Um, we are still accepting applications. We don't have an astronomy course though, because I used to teach for it. I started in 2006 teaching for this program and then I became the academic director in 2013. And at that point we did not have an, an astronomy course anymore because I was busy with other stuff. So uh, I am also a kids science writer. And the way that that happened, it's kind of odd for somebody who works in academia to start writing for kids. So here's how it happened. I had the spark of an idea back in about 2010, I would say. And the idea was I was on vacation uh, driving and I looked up and I saw the moon. And if you have ever seen the full moon, you can always make little pictures from, from all of these dark patches that are here. Oh, I'm not sure if people can see. Let me see, is that my thing? There we go. I'm gonna have a little laser pointer thing now. Now we can see it. So these, these dark patches on the moon are called Maria. Uh, that's the plural of mare, which means seas or oceans. They thought that there was water on the moon at one point. And so if you've ever looked at them closely, you can make all kinds of uh, patterns out of these maria. And one of the patterns that I see all the time is that it looks like a bunny. So if you connect all of these things, you can see their, the, the bunny's ears and it's leaping. This is a little bit different from um, if, if anybody is familiar with uh, Asian moon mythology, it's a little bit different from that bunny, but so I like to see this bunny. And uh, so I imagined a little rabbit looking at the moon and discovering the phases of the moon. And I wrote a picture book manuscript and then I thought, oh great, now what do I do? Oh. And I can't advance my side. Great. So I looked up on the web, uh, which is what you do when you don't know what to do. And I found the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, SCBWI. I joined. I went to a couple of uh, workshops. And one of the workshops I went to was how to write for magazines. And I started writing for kids' magazines. At this point, I have written 30 uh, articles in kids nonfiction magazines, mostly for the Cricket Magazine group, but also for highlights. And I've written about astronomy, of course, but I've also written about such diverse topics as uh, chemotherapy, wastewater treatment, and for this particular magazine, I don't know if you can see this, I wrote about Mariah Mitchell. So I just can't seem to leave the Mariah Mitchell Observatory. Um, as a result of writing all of these articles, I was contacted by an acquiring author at Story Publishing. They like to find uh, experts in particular fields that they want books written about. And it's an extra uh, sort of bonus if that person can also write. So I had this proven track record of being able to write and being able to write for kids. And so the book that eventually came out of that is called Sky Gazing, a guide to the moon, sun, planets, stars, eclipses, and constellations. I always forget the order of, of the subtitle. It's a guide for kids nine to 14 years old to observing the sky, naked eye, day or night, from wherever they are. I also have some binocular hints. It's published by, again, Story Publishing, which is out in Western Massachusetts as well. It's an imprint of Workman Press. And I've got two other books that are coming out. They're for the library and school market, and they are so brand new that I don't have any um, uh, covers or pictures of their covers. So, but the reason that I am here is because in 1986, I worked at this place, um, although it didn't quite look like this right over here. Regina and I discovered that this part, uh, which is an extension of the astronomer's cottage that attaches it to the uh, observatory that was built the year after I was there. Um, so uh, I started out doing outreach 
in college. That's one of the things that I do as part of my job. I don't do research. I teach introductory observational courses for observing the sky naked eye or learning how to use telescopes. And I do a lot, a lot, a lot of outreach. My writing, I consider to be part of my outreach. So I go and talk to school groups and I go and talk to libraries. And that really started at the Mariah Mitchell Observatory. Here's a little picture of what I used to look like back then. Uh, and I don't have, I could not find any pictures of myself at the observatory, but I do have proof that I was at the observatory. This is um, an excerpt from uh, Lee Belserine. Uh, her report to the uh, Mariah Mitchell Association, the 19 to the 1986 um, report. And you can see I'm the very, very bottom there. Meg Lysett, um, I gave a talk for kids, Stories in the Stars. So it really did all start at the Mariah Mitchell Observatory. So why do outreach? Why do I do astronomy outreach? Well, I consider astronomy, I like to call it a gateway science. And that is, it's a science that is really, 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 really interesting to kids. As you can see from this book cover over here, the Smithsonian Guide to Space. I mean, look at all the exciting stuff that's there. I mean, space is just exploding with stuff that kids are really, really, really interested in. So that's why I call it a gateway science. So I do talks at local schools and libraries. I give talks for scout troops at the um, observatory at Smith College. I've been to after school programs, churches, summer camps. Um, and the reason that I do astronomy outreach is that it provides kids with information on astronomy that is up to date compared maybe to the stuff that they're learning in their classes. It also can enhance their traditional learning to actually see a person who is an astronomer who comes in and tells them all about astronomy. It's a way to reach diverse audiences. Um, if you think about it, the, the nonfiction fiction books and magazines that I write are available to all kids. Uh, uh, at libraries, in classrooms, highlights is in every dentist office in the United States. Um, so I can reach, there's practically no barrier to access and I can reach a diverse audience and attract them to astronomy in particular, but also science in general. I really would love all the kids to become astronomers, but I'm okay if they become some other kind of science or just an informed citizen. Um, so I'm educating the next generation of scientists or, you know, whatever it is that you want to talk about to kids. Um, and for me, it really has improved my writing and communication skills. Um, it is, I've learned to write concisely. I've learned to write for particular audiences. Um, so it really is just a great way to reach kids where they are with stuff that they're interested in. All right, so, um, oh, right. And here was my, here was my little uh, uh, plug for diversity. Why do I reach, why is it important to me to reach out to diverse audiences? Because I want science to be diverse. I'm part of an underrepresented, slightly, very slightly underrepresented group in astronomy as a, as a woman. Um, however, I'm a white woman, so my path has been a lot easier than astronomers of color or astronomers from the LGBTQIA con community or astronomers with disabilities. So um, one of the nice things about doing outreach with kids is trying to make sure that you show them people who look like them doing science. And this is um, a picture book about Ellen Ochoa, who is um, a Latina astronaut. Um, and that's her playing the flute in space, which is so cool. That's just one of the many, many cool things about her. Um, so in order to be kid appropriate, um, I have to know my audience. So I have to make sure that I have that that I present topics that are of high interest to kids. So anything that's weird or gross 
or cool or scary or cute or relevant to their own lives. So for example, um, extremes, kids love extremes. How big, how many, how hot, how far away. There are a lot of extremes in astronomy. Uh, things that are really weird, like black holes. What happens when you get close to a black hole? It'll stretch you out. It'll stretch your molecules out. You'll get sucked in. You can't call for help. So kids love black holes. Um, things that relate to their own life are things like, where did we come from? Are we alone in the universe? What would it be like to be on another planet? I like to talk about the potential for life on each of the planets in our solar system or uh, planets that are outside of our solar system. Um, I often will compare things to Earth. How much stronger is the gravity? How much weaker is the gravity? What would happen if you tried to do the normal things that you do on Earth on Jupiter? Well, for one thing, you'd sink through the surface. Um, and you can also talk about the past or future of what's going to happen to our solar system. So all of these things make uh, talks or articles that I'm writing or books interesting and engaging for kids. It's also important to be developmentally and conceptually appropriate. And the way that I prepare myself for that kind of stuff is um, I try to align with the Common Core Standards and the Next Generation Science Standards. And it turns out if you are interested in doing outreach, um, pretty much every subject area has some kind of standard. So there are social studies standards, there are PE and health standards, there are art standards for schools and music standards. Um, you can also check your state department of education standards. That's something that I always do. If I'm going to be approaching second graders, I wanna know what second graders are learning. Do they know calculus? Probably not. Do they know what atoms and molecules are? Also probably not, but they know what density is, for example. So they've done sink or float experiments. So I can talk about Saturn, if we could build some kind of ginormous swimming pool of some kind, Saturn would float because it's less dense than water. Um, so I also like to make sure that in all of my, because I am a particular kind of person, I like to make sure that I show astronomers of color, female astronomers, astronomers with disabilities, and try to highlight their work when I'm uh, doing presentations or talks. Um, I have done a few, I've written a few profiles of scientists as well. Um, and I always try to go for younger people um, and people who are not what you would typically think of as uh, the, the white male scientist in a lab coat, which astronomers don't even wear. <clears throat> so uh, I do writing and I also do presentations. So when I'm writing, I try to make sure that I keep my vocabulary appropriate and uh, uh, check the reading level. So these are some tools that I write, that I use the Children's Writer's Word Book. And then I actually throw all of my text through this great thing, which is the ATOS analyzer. And oh shoot, I forgot to look up what ATOS stood for. Um, but it's basically reading level. So it gives you, it gives you a reading level. Um, however, just because I'm writing for kids doesn't mean that I dumb everything down. Uh, you can use field specific terms. You can use big words as long as you define what they are. So most magazine articles will have a little glossary at the end or they'll have little boxes here and there and you can approach different age groups and different uh, people who are at different levels using things like sidebars. Um, and that's really fun. Another thing that I like to talk to kids about is not just talking about astronomy, but I like to talk about writing. So nonfiction writing, and I talk about text features like glossary terms and sidebars. Um, when I visit schools, this is a really terrible picture of me <laughs> visiting a school. This is really, this is my face. Um, you can see that I'm sort of in the same place. There's my, there's my little background. Um, I'm, I'm doing a Zoom at a school in Connecticut. Um, I always make sure that I know what's being covered in the curriculum around the time that I'm going in and how 
what I'm presenting is going to relate to their curriculum. I communicate with the teacher or a librarian in advance and find out what they want. What are their kids interested in? Can I talk for 20 minutes? Can I talk for an hour? Are the kids gonna get wiggly? Um, I often will solicit student questions before I go. So the students will send me a whole bunch of questions. I'll group them together by topic. Uh, I'll decide which ones I'm probably not going to be able to answer and I'll answer as many as I can. I will usually provide activities and projects that we do during my presentation. Um, and oops, I forgot to add something to my little bullet list, but uh, I also will give them take home papers. So I'll, I'll have something that they can uh, write about or a coloring page or something like that that goes home with them just so that their uh, parents and caregivers know what's going on and, and what kinds of stuff that they did. It's really important for me to, to do as much active stuff as possible um, as opposed to being what we call the sage on a stage, which is what I'm doing right now, which is the absolute worst kind of teaching. So I apologize for doing the absolute worst kind of teaching with you. Um, I often will stay late. I'll stay after the class and just sit around and answer as many questions as I possibly can, all of the ones that pop up. Sometimes I'll bring a telescope to look at the sun uh, or to look at the moon or Jupiter if they are up during the day. Oh my goodness, I thought that I turned off my ringer. I am so sorry about that. There we go. I accidentally answered it as well. All right. Oh, I turned off the wrong thing. Okay. <laughs> the world is Zoom now. All right, and I also try and work all of these things in with, with virtual visits as well. So that's how I do outreach with kids who are in my neighborhood or in my sphere. How can you do astronomy with your kids? And I put a little asterisk next to your kids because they don't need to be your personal kids. Um, they can be nieces and nephews. They can be kids in your uh, neighborhood. They can be grandkids. Um, so this is just general uh, information about how to do astronomy with kids. Uh, my, my very important advice for everyone is make sure you start out simple. So don't immediately go straight for black holes. Start out simple. Uh, know what's in the sky. These are a couple of uh, uh, websites that you can go to. In the sky.org is a sky calendar. You can look up what's happening with the moon or the sun or any of the planets. Uh, it will figure out what your location is and tell you what's happening in the sky um, for the week or the month. Skyandtelescope.com and, and astronomy.com. Those are the websites of Sky and Telescope Magazine and Astronomy Magazine. So they have what's up in the sky and they also have uh, astronomy current events, which can be really fun and space science current events, which kids are often very, very interested in. There are a lot of things that you can observe in the sky with or without a telescope. So you and your kids can learn the constellations. I always like to tell people, if you know one constellation, you can find all of the other constellations because you just need to look at a constellation chart. Like if you know the Big Dipper, you can use the Big Dipper to find the Little Dipper, Cassiopeia, um, uh, Boötes, Leo, Pegasus. There are all kinds of things that you can use um, if you know one constellation. Uh, find out where the planets are so that in the sky.org and sky and telescope and astronomy.com are all good places to find out where the planets are. Meteor showers are super fun to watch with your kids, although you do have to wake up at like two o'clock in the morning to see them. Uh, the last time I did that, my kids actually thanked me. Uh, eclipses can be fun too, lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. Uh, I don't know how many people know this, but there are some eclipses coming up. I'll tell you about an upcoming lunar eclipse, but in 2023, October of 2023, 
there will be an annular solar eclipse. And in April of 2024, there will be a total solar eclipse that will be uh, visible to most people in the United States and Mexico and uh, Eastern Canada. So that's really exciting. Um, even just watching sunrise or watching sunset can be really, really interesting and an astronomical experience. Um, and there are lots of, uh, there, sorry, there are lots of news items that come out whenever there's going to be a really interesting or a really bright display of the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. Or if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, I don't know if any of you are joining me from the Southern Hemisphere, it's the Aurora Australis there. So those are amazing to watch if you're far north or far south. Um, go to your local library when the questions get complicated. So check in with your local librarian. Um, uh, let me see. Astronomy is 529 in the Dewey Decimal System. You just have to know these things when you write. Um, Make sure that you keep the child's developmental level in mind. So check the back of your book and see what the reading level is or what the interest level is. And you'll, you know that it'll be age appropriate to your kids. For example, don't talk to uh, kindergartners about black holes because they don't really even know what gravity is. But you can talk about black holes a lot to even kids who are in the fifth grade. I very, very, very much encourage uh, people to do an astronomy observing notebook. So you can do, so this is, this is one of the things that's in my book is just take a notebook. You can take an old notebook and rip pages that are already used out of it, decorate it, make it your astronomy notebook. You can draw what you see in the sky. You can write down things that happen in the sky. You can write down how it makes you feel and draw pictures that are related to it, but not necessarily of the thing. So an astronomy observing notebook is really fun for kids. And it also is great for teaching them to start taking careful observations and being good scientists. Um, I incur uh, uh, When you're doing astronomy with your kids, make sure that you encourage growth mindset. So growth mindset means that uh, you don't need to know everything. You don't, it, just because you fail one time doesn't mean you are going to continue failing. Um, and in fact, uh, learning through failure is a good thing. Like if you can't find a constellation the first time you try, you could just keep trying and you will be able to find it. Um, and finally, should you use a telescope or not? So um, I sort of uh, I, I sort of gave away the ending here, which is in the description of my talk. I say that the best the best first telescope is actually a pair of binoculars. But now I'm going to tell you why. So here are some beginner telescopes on the Orion website. So Orion is a company that makes telescopes. Just go to telescopes.com literally, and this is what you will find if you search for beginner telescopes. So as you can see, beginner telescopes come in all sizes and shapes and price ranges as well. You will get what you pay for. So the uh, telescopes, that are under $100 are going to be a little bit smaller. Their optics might not be as good as the more expensive ones. Their uh, tripods might be a little bit more rickety. They might not have as many accessories. But as you can see, you can go out and pay $400 for a hat stand. I mean, sorry, a telescope that is going to become a hat stand if you don't know how to use it. And if, you're, if your uh, kid has never looked through a telescope before. So what I usually suggest is that people use binoculars instead, because binoculars are really easy for kids to look through, especially little kids, and especially kids who have never looked through a telescope or a microscope before. We kind of take it for granted, looking through something that only has one eye. You know, if you're old like me, you remember cameras where you only looked through with one eye. But that's a really, really hard skill to learn for kids. Um, and if they don't know 
what they're going to be seeing and why it's important and why it's better than just looking at the sky with a naked eye, they're not going to be really interested. They're going to be easily frustrated and they're going to give up. Um, conversely, if you have a pair of binoculars, this, by the way, is a, uh, a page from uh, my book, Sky Gazing. Um, kids can look with both eyes through them and it, they're very, very easy to point because they have a wide field of view. That means they show a lot of the sky. Telescopes tend to really, really uh, zoom in and only show you a teeny part of the sky. And, and what that magnification means is that you don't see much of the sky. So it's very hard to point at exactly the right spot in the sky. Yes, even if you have an automated telescope, because automated telescopes aren't 100% automated, they always are, uh, can be off by a tiny bit. And if you've only got a small piece of the sky, if you're, if you're only looking at less than one degree of the sky and your telescope is pointing more than one degree off, then you're not going to find your thing that you're trying to look at. Um, it also, the magnification also tends to magnify the movement of your telescope. So if you try to point at an object and you think, oh, maybe it's over here to the right, you move the telescope a little bit and it will go way across the sky. So binoculars are really easy to look through. They're really easy to point. You just basically look at whatever object it is you wanna look at and then put the binoculars up to your eyeballs and you will pretty much be in the right place. You can see all kinds of great stuff with binoculars. And once you and your kid become really proficient at looking through binoculars at the sky, then it's time to buy a telescope if you wish. If not, there are some really great binoculars out there. Um, so let me see. And you can also probably, I, I would guess that probably half to three quarters of the people, well, the people in this particular audience, maybe 100% of you, have a pair of binoculars languishing somewhere in a closet or the bottom of a drawer somewhere. Take them out, dust them off, and point them at the sky. Not the sun. Point them at the nighttime sky. All right. So this is the part of my book that is all about binoculars. What else do I have here? Oh, right. This is how to point binoculars. So you can see there's a person here looking very easily. Look how happy this person is looking at the, at, uh, at the sky with binoculars. Um, in addition to that, in, in my book, I have a guide to buying binoculars or uh, looking using the binoculars that you have. This picture right here is a picture of a pair of binoculars that was in my closet. I literally just took out my phone and took a picture and sent it and it made it into the book. Um, so I've got a photo credit in my, in my own book. Um, so you can see that if you were looking at the moon with your eye, it would look this big and you'd be able to see this much stuff on it. But if you use even an, uh, a small pair of binoculars that magnifies by three or even seven times, you can see a lot more detail. You can see a lot of craters. You don't have to go all the way up to 10x or 15x. Um, that's, that's 10 times magnification or 15 times magnification. Um, to get really amazing views of the sky. My book also has a list of things that you can look at in the sky. And I'm going to highlight this one right here, the beehive cluster. This is one of my favorite things to look at and it looks incredible through uh, binoculars. So I've got in here all kinds of different clusters of stars and uh, nebulae and double stars and stars that are bright colors, especially when you point binoculars at them. Another great thing to point binoculars at, obviously, is going to be uh, the moon, as you see in that picture, but also uh, planets like Jupiter. Um, in Saturn, you really can't see the rings, but it still looks cool and orange. All right, or this is the best of all possible worlds. Do you have a telescope that is this nice? Nice. I'm guessing you probably don't. And you can't buy a telescope this nice at Orion. This is the Lloyd's Observatory. 
So this is a really nifty telescope, and there are a lot of places in the world that have telescopes. You can find a local observatory in your area. Check out uh, colleges and universities where you live. Check out science museums. A lot of them will have telescopes and they'll have open houses. Check their websites. Um, planetarium. So planetarium is an indoor thing that has a dome and it shows a simulated sky, but some of them also have uh, telescopes associated with them. And also look up your local astronomy club. Again, I forgot to put a little link there. Uh, the Astronomical League, just Google Astronomical League. That is uh, a club of clubs. So it is um, a, a national organization for astronomy clubs. And you can go and look through these telescopes, even though you don't own them. All right, so now I am going to talk a little bit about what's up in the sky this month. So things that you can look at right now. So there's a chapter in my book uh, called Stars and Constellations. And in that I have the constellations for uh, the northern, the, the, the north sky around the north, um, the north star and the southern part of the sky uh, for people who live in the southern hemisphere, if they can see like the southern cross. And then for four seasons, this one is for the February, March and April stars. So these are the stars that are going to be up. If you look towards the southeast, um, you'll see here is a piece of the Big Dipper. This is the handle of the Big Dipper. By the way, this star right here is called Mizar, and it has a little tiny star right next to it. If you look at it with binoculars, you can see um, two stars, one very bright, one very dim, Alcor and Mizar, the horse and rider in the middle of the handle of the Big Dipper. The handle of the Big Dipper makes an arc to the, the star Arcturus, if you continue in that arc, you will end up at Spica or Spica, which is uh, the brightest star. In fact, the only bright star in Virgo. I can never find Virgo. I can only find Spica. Um, and then continue on to this little constellation called Corvus the Crow, which is a tiny little like trapezoid. Is that a trapezoid? No, nah, it's not even a trapezoid. All right. Um, but this group of stars over here is Boötes, which looks kind of like an ice cream cone on its side. Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown, one of the few constellations that actually looks like what it is. It's a little crown. It's it's kind of a um, uh, what is it? A diadem. The little the little tiny crowns that you have, and and this is Gemma. So the little the the little uh, jewel right in the middle of your crown. And then uh, the constellation of Hercules is right here. But the main constellation that I'm going to point out uh, a little bit later on in this talk is Leo the lion. Looks kind of like a question mark right here. The bright, there's the bright star Regulus. He is, the lion is sitting down. Here are his front paws. And here are his haunches. That's a polite word for his bum. Uh, so those are the stars that you, or the constellations that you can look at in uh, the, the April and late April sky. In my book, I also have star stories from all over the world. This particular one is a Native American star, star story, actually Native Canadian. Uh, the the Mi'kmaq people um, talk about a bear hunt. There are a bunch of birds that are following the um, the bear in Ursa Major, and it's actually a story about the seasons. I'm not going to tell it today. Uh, I told that story a week ago when I was on Nantucket Island. All right, so the spring sky, if you look north, you can always see the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, and Cassiopeia, no matter what time of year it is. They'll be oriented a little bit differently at different times of year, but you'll be able to see all of those stars because they're what, what are called circumpolar constellations. They never rise or set. You can see them all the time. Uh, in the east, you'll see Boötes, Hercules, and Corona Borealis. Overhead, you'll see the constellation of Leo. And in the west, 
the stars that are leaving us now, because stars all have seasons, the stars that are leaving us are the winter constellations, Orion, Gemini, Canis Major, Canis Minor, Taurus, and Auriga. If you look at a star chart, um, M44, that beehive little cluster that I told you about that's very interesting to look at with binoculars, is in between the constellations of Leo and Gemini. Uh, you can also see the moon, of course. You can usually often see the moon. The moon right now is rising very late it, at night. If you really want to blow your kids away, point out the, 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 the moon tomorrow morning if it's clear. It will be up in the sky in the morning because the moon is not always up. Uh, during the night, as my kids know, because I'm al I, I always pointed it out to them when they were little. Uh, Venus and Jupiter, and actually also Mars and Saturn, are visible just before sunrise. Uh, and in fact, this coming Friday, there will be a really neat lineup. You need to get out there at around 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning, just because the sun is rising so, so early. They'll be all lined up um, in between the sun and the moon. And it's really cool, just in a straight line. Again, look at inthesky.org to find out where those are and when they're going to be visible. And there's going to be a total lunar eclipse. So exciting. So there will be a total lunar eclipse on the night slash early morning of May 16th. And... I told, oh, wait a minute. I told, uh, oops, let me see. What can I do here? No, pointer options, change. There we go. Um, I was telling Regina, I always have trouble doing, uh, changing my screen share, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And I'm gonna show you, oh, this one right here, the eclipse. All right, so I'm going to screen share again. Wonderful. And there it is. All right, so this is yet another uh, recommended website. Uh, it's called timeanddate.com. And this is going to be a lunar eclipse. So if you go to this website, it shows you a lot of things. For where I live, it tells me that um, the eclipse will start at 9.30 on May 15th, and it will end at 2.50 May 16th. And I'll show you what that all looks like. So at 9.30, oh, whoops, this is the wrong one. This shows where it's visible. So those of us in the Eastern part of the US, and Central America and South America. Oh, and, and all of my friends who are in Antarctica zooming in to this talk, uh, you'll be able to see the lunar eclipse as well. And this is what a lunar eclipse looks like for those of you who have never seen one. I'm just gonna fast forward through it. So what happens is you see the full moon, the uh, lunar eclipse occurs when the shadow of the earth falls on the full moon. And the first thing that happens is the outer fuzzy gray part of the Earth's shadow crosses the moon and pretty much nobody notices until this happens. The shadow, the central dark part of the Earth's shadow goes across the moon and it looks like this until all I can see is a little sliver and then the moon is completely in the shadow so here's the full moon in the shadow of the earth. And now you see why it is called the blood moon. It turns red, continues, and you can see the shadow moving off of the moon and that gray part of the shadow, the penumbra, moving off of the moon as well. So the most interesting parts of the, uh, the, inter the most interesting times during a lunar eclipse are the beginning, when the uh, total shadow comes across and the moon, the full moon gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, that takes about an hour. And then the eclipse itself is very interesting, just looking at this wonderful red moon. 
And then the very uh, end part of it is also interesting. But sitting through this whole thing when it's just read, uh, your children do not have to stay up late at night to watch that. So just this part and when it gets when it gets read. So for example, I am not going to be so right here when the full eclipse begins, sorry, the partial eclipse from 1027 to 1129, that's going to be the really fun part. I'll stay up a little bit later and then I will go to sleep and not watch the rest of the eclipse. Or if you're a morning person, you can wake up at 1253. That's a real morning person. 12.53 a.m. and watch it until the end of the partial eclipse. All right, back to my PowerPoint. All right, the total lunar eclipse on the May 15th into the 16th. It will be very, very cool. All right, another thing that's coming up uh, in April is the Nantucket Star Count. So the Nantucket Star Count is actually on the Mariah Mitchell Association calendar. I encourage you all to go to it. Um, I've decided I'm not going to go to this particular website right now. Um, so this is www.darksky.org is this, the International Dark Sky Association. This is their homepage, their landing page. One of the slides they have is International Dark Sky Week, which is April 22nd to 30th. That's when the, the moon is in um, a phase where you don't see it much at night. So it's, it's um, a little bit before the new moon and a little bit after the new moon and encompassing a couple of weekends so people can go out and stay up late and, and look at this. And one of the things that they ask you to do, if you click on that learn more button, is um, to go to a program uh, that is called the Globe at Night. And this is a citizen science project that uh, discovers what light pollution is all over the world. And it's an ongoing thing. So they can see how uh, light pollution is changing. So during International Dark Sky Week, I encourage you all to look at Leo. Here's how to look at Leo. I'm zooming in and zooming in. There's Leo, looks like a big question mark in the sky. Um, and the project Globe at Night actually has pictures of what Leo looks like if you can only see the really bright stars and what it looks like if you can only see the really faint stars and everything in between. So you match up a chart with what you see in your sky and uh, you make a report and they'll take all of this data. They do it every single month, every single year. Um, it's really, really interesting. It's sponsored by Noir Lab, which is uh, N-O-I-R, which is um, an association of uh, US uh, public observatories that, that professional astronomers use. All right, if you don't have my book and you don't uh, uh, to find Leo, you can go to this place, skymaps.com. They print out a new sky map every single month. And these are great things to print out and use uh, with, your, uh, with the kids in your life. I forgot one very major thing is, which is when you go outside and you look at the stars, make sure to take a red flashlight so it won't ruin your dark vision. You can just take um, a flashlight and stretch a red balloon over it or put like, I've got actually some pieces of red plastic tablecloth and I just put it over and, and put a little uh, rubber band on to, to attach it. Um, and I was, I was sharing stories about what it was like to be a Mariah Mitchell intern back in the day with Regina last week. And I told this story and she said, oh, you've got to tell that story because it's about light pollution. So in 1986, so the, the Mariah Mitchell Observatory had actually has a uh, photographic plate collection going back to the early 1900s. Photographic plates are just photographs that that were taken uh, back when it was on film. Um, instead of uh, uh, digital cameras. So there are pieces of glass with photographic emulsion on them that reacts to light and takes pictures of the night sky. We had five science interns who were on rotation. We had one person who was 
our teaching intern and she didn't have to do the nighttime observing. And we had to take these pictures when it was dark, 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 in the, it, it, which meant after twilight. So the sun had to be 15 degrees below the horizon when the, when the sky is super dark. Uh, after twilight and before the moon rose, as soon as the moon rose, we had to stop taking uh, observations because we wanted a clear, dark sky. Um, so we'd go evening twilight to moonrise, or we'd go, if the moon was up in the beginning of the night, we'd go from moonset to just before sunrise. And the way that we figured it out, figured out whether or not it was cloudy was very difficult because normally when you're in a place where there's light pollution, or if the moon is out, you can see clouds. But if you're in a place with very little light pollution, like uh, Nantucket in 1986, you can't see the clouds. The only way you can tell that clouds are there is by the absence of stars. And so I'm gonna show you what we did. Here is the night sky. Um, you can see the Milky Way down uh, on the bottom. And you might be able to see uh, the summer triangle. So let me do my little, yeah, here we go. I'm gonna make my laser pointer again. So, whoops. Uh, here is Altair, Vega, and Deneb. They make up the summer triangle, three nice bright stars. Deneb is in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan, which is swimming along the Milky Way. And there's the Milky Way down there. So this is what the sky looked like in the summer in Nantucket. And this is what this, this is what it looked like when the weather was clear. This is what it looked like when the weather was cloudy. Anybody see the difference? Do that again. Clear, cloudy, clear, cloudy. So basically we had to go outside, stand on the roof of the observatory and wait 15 minutes for our eyes to adapt to the darkness so that we could see if there were any stars missing from the sky. And if they were, then we would go to bed. And I was telling Regina, the best nights of all were the nights when you woke up and you could hear the foghorn and we'd just go right back to bed. We didn't have to come and see if the stars were, were there or not. We could just go to bed because we knew for sure it was gonna be too cloudy if that foghorn was going. So thank you so much for listening to my talk to this point. Um, my concluding words for you are, if you wanna do astronomy with your kids, dust off your binoculars. Check sky gazing out of the library. I don't require that you buy it. Uh, enjoy the sky wherever you are. Even if you have light pollution, there are plenty of things you can look at. The sun is an astronomical object. The moon is an astronomical object. You can see Jupiter and uh, Venus from Times Square in New York City. Uh, you can see the International Space Station flying by. It's really fun. Um, so you don't have to see every single star. You don't have to be in a place like Nantucket where the skies are dark. Um, spread the word about astronomy. Don't just tell your own kids. Go out and tell all the other kids about them. Go and visit your local library or, um, uh, or school and talk to them about astronomy or whatever you are an expert in. It's really fun. And keep Nantucket dark. Uh, if you are interested in other astronomy books besides mine, these are a bunch of them. Uh, there are things to look at 50 things to see with a telescope for kids. There's actually an adult version as well, if you want that. Um, a couple of books about, you know, what space is. And then these two here, star stories. These are star stories from all over the world. And the forever sky is uh, Ojibwe and Lakota myths about the stars. Annette Lee is an expert in native uh, sky stories and native constellations um, and uh, teaches at St. Cloud State in Minnesota and just has done a ton of stuff. All right, I am going to stop right now. Really? Ah. My laser pointer is making it so that I can't stop. There we go. I'm stop sharing.
Yay. Thank you so much. Four whole minutes for. Oh my gosh. This is, this was so fantastic. This was packed with so much information and so many useful tips and tricks. And I was like very inspired right now. Um, this, this was absolutely great, Meg. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just say if anybody out there has any questions, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A or the chat and we have a couple minutes that we can take anyone's questions. While we're waiting, uh, I have a few questions of my own and also I'll just really quick for anybody who is located on Nantucket, I'm just going to put in a plug, we will be having two events this coming weekend for the Nantucket star, star count that Meg mentioned. Um, and by the way, I should say, we're trying to push it on Nantucket, but you can actually do this anywhere. So no matter where you are um, this next week, the 22nd to the 30th, uh, go out, find Leo, take a look at the Globe at Night page. You can enter in your lo your own location or your phone will, will tell the website what your location is and, and kind of participate in this project. You don't have to be on Nantucket to do it. Um, if you are here on Nantucket, feel free to come out to the Loins Observatory on both Friday and Saturday nights from 8.30 to 10 p.m., where we'll be going through this in more detail. Um, so you're welcome to come out to that. Um, let's see, we do have a question. Oh. Um, uh, Alyssa says, great talk, Meg. Are there any particular books you would recommend for pre-K aged kids? Oh, there are so many. Well, one of my favorites is What Miss Mitchell Saw. <laughs> by a friend of mine, Haley Barrett. Um, it's about the life of Mariah Mitchell, or at least the, the astronomical life of, of Mariah Mitchell, um, pretty much up to the time that she uh, discovered the comet. Um, there is a National Geographic, of course, of course, I should have made a list. Um, there's a National Geographic book uh, about space for littler kids. Let me see if I can just Google it. Um, it could be, I think it's the soul, an introduction to the solar system. Uh, let me see, solar system kids. There we go. Uh, everything space and uh, the planets. It's a little kid's book. Yeah. That's what it is. The National Geographic Little Kids First Big Book of Space. I just love the title <laughs> and I can never remember it because it's it's long. Um, uh, but oh, oh, how many of you know that you can actually search in uh, Amazon by age? So if you go to Amazon, I don't I don't necessarily recommend buying everything from from Amazon for books. I really like bookshop.org, but Amazon has this nifty function. Uh, where you can you can search books by age, so so it's it's usually it's on the left, so so you can search by subject and then you can narrow it down by age group. I'll just ask a follow up question: Do you have on a website or anything like that your list of recommended books? Because um, I often get asked actually for recommendations and then I always have to do some Googling and some thinking and whatnot. And I'm just wondering, like, if you have a list already that you have on a website, maybe we could get your advice and create a list on the Mariah Mitchell website for folks who, you know, have questions and they could refer back to. I know you mentioned several really great books, including your own, of course, in this talk. And it would be great to maybe create, um, you know, a sort of listing somewhere on the Mariah Mitchell website of recommended books. Um, um, I don't, but you know who does is Emily Lakdawalla, who is wonderful. Um, so she's got a, a recommended kids space books. So let me see. Uh, oh, yes. Always looking up. I forgot about that. Nancy Grace Roman book. All right. So so she actually reviews all of them. So she went through all of them. I'm going to I'm going to share this real quick. Uh, so that everyone can write down the link. Um, you can certainly, whoops, hello, share. There's the button, there we go. All right, here we go. Um, so it's at uh, the, the Planetary Society, oops, sorry, that's the globe at night. Oh, I told you I wouldn't do that, but I did. Uh, so this is the citizen science uh, thing. Total lunar eclipse, there's Emily Lactawala. All right, so that's how you spell Lakdawalla, L-A-K-D-A-W-A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. 
So Emily Lakdawalla is a, um, uh, she was a planetary scientist and now she is an artist and journalist. She's been a space journalist for a very, very, very long time. Um, but this is an excellent list of books. It lists them by ages, zero through three. So here are a bunch of them. Hello world solar system. And uh, she actually she actually has um, uh, uh, reviewed each one of them. And there was, where was the other one? Faces of the Moon is a great one uh, by Bob Krellen. Uh, where is the one? Darn, unfortunately, I can't see. There it is. Earth, my, four, my first 4.54 billion years. So it is from the point of view of Earth, telling, telling where Earth came from. Um, she has since then, so Stacey McAnulty, amazing science writer, has since then uh, written a book about the sun and the moon, and I believe a whole bunch of planets are, are to come. I think she's, she's got a, a book about Mars already. So, so Emily Lakdawalla, definitely, she's got the list. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's awesome. And uh, just an FYI for everyone um, who's listening, we are recording and this webinar will be available on the Mariah Mitchell YouTube channel starting tomorrow or so. So if you missed anything right now, um, you can totally check out the recording um, to jot down all of these names and sites. And we might even try to figure out a, a place to put a, a link to a lot of these listings on the Mariah Mitchell website. Because um, I am starting to make a list about uh, that. That's books about enjoying the night sky and being out at night at night in general and uh light pollution and of course i you know all of them have flown out of my out of my mind right uh, right now but that's okay oh the story right. of venetia bernie the girl who named pluto this is such a great list of books <laughs> um and i did want to say uh this globe at night pro project that's one thing that i forgot to put in my massively long powerpoint was there are a lot of citizen science projects out there. Just Google citizen science astronomy and you will find zillions of them. There, that's a way for regular people, including children, to contribute to actual science. So there are all kinds of things like classifying galaxies and identifying craters on the moon and you know, reporting what your uh, light pollution is. Tons and tons and tons of them. Uh, the NASA site's a really good place to go to, of course. All right. Oh, um, let's see. We have uh, one comment in the chat um, from Maya who says, "Great talk. Thank you. This will also um, help with advice to my adult friends. So I think maybe you know, um, don't undersell your book for children. I think it can be useful for adults as well." Well, that's the joke. This the, the, the subtitle used to be a kid's guide to the stars, planets, blah, blah, blah. And the when the, the proof of the book started circulating around my publisher, all of the editors and interns and everybody who read it said, there's stuff in here that I don't know. We should take the word kid out of this. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great. Sure. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I see that there's another question. Yeah. So the next question is from Myra, who is actually a past uh, MMO intern as okay. well. Um, yes. And Myra says, I love this talk. Uh, when did you start to realize you wanted to write for children and do public outreach as part of your career? Um, I have always wanted to do public outreach. So I was, I, you know, first at Mariah Mitchell Observatory, really and truly, um, because we ran the we ran the open house the open nights at Loins, and I loved it. Just having people, not just kids, but adults, come through too, and and you know, just asking questions, and you have to be on your toes, and and it's it's really fun. Just I I enjoy thinking on my feet. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> And um, so then when I, I, I also did it in college, um, Hallie's Comet came by. This is how old I am, people. Hallie's Comet came by and we showed it to um, all of, the, all of the, uh, the entire surrounding town uh, through our telescopes. It was very boring um, and, and lackluster, but we also showed them other stuff. Oh yes, Peg, SciStarter.org is a great place for finding um, citizen science projects. Um, so, 
So it was really in college. And then uh, when I was in grad school, we did a lot of outreach as well. I enjoyed teaching much more than I enjoyed research. And so I started a PhD program at UMass and I stopped it because uh, I found out that I really liked the teaching and the outreach and I didn't really like sitting in a room and, and um, you know, writing programs. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's when, and, and for writing, I've just, I've always liked writing. I never really thought of being a children's writer until really like 2010. That guy came late to that. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question, which is about how many children do you talk to in a year? And I, I'm oh. sure it's been a bit different with the pandemic and whatnot, but you know, maybe. Yeah, it's been very different with the, with the pandemic. I have not been doing very many visits, not even virtual school visits, because, you know, it's, it's hard to even find people to talk to. <laughs> um, so school groups are just not thinking of that. They're, they're thinking, you know, how am I going to get through this next day? Mm -hmm. um, I would say on, on average during a year, I probably have uh, three or four school groups come through. I also, I work with my undergraduates, um, my undergraduate astronomy major students at Smith, and they help me out with all of these as well. So three or four school groups will come through. We try to do um, an open house at our observatory about once a month, although this spring was terrible. The weather has just been awful and it's gonna continue that way. Um, and and then just sort of on the fly kinds of things that I where I leave Smith to to do to go and talk to schools and libraries I would say I'd probably do three or four talks for those um, and so how many children hundreds <laughs> not thousands <laughs> that's my that's my best guess <laughs> sorry no that's great that's that's fantastic um let's see so uh, we're a little bit past the time if anybody has any final questions please pop them in now um i was gonna ask you you kind of mentioned this um with the beehive but i'm wondering what your favorite starter object slash constellation slash whatever is when you first say have a a group of young people and you're outside with them at night what do you what do you start with well, if it's winter, I start with Orion because most people know Orion and Orion is great because there, there are a lot of, there's, there's this thing called the winter hexagon, which is actually seven, not six bright stars surrounding one of the bright stars in Orion. And so you can find all these bright stars and then you can find the constellation that the bright stars are in. It's a really great way to learn constellations. My favorite thing to look at with binoculars in the winter, my two favorite things um, are the Pleiades because you look at it and it's the seven sisters, you can actually only see six stars approximately naked eye and you point binoculars at it and there are hundreds mm -hmm. and they're all born together. So they really are sister stars. Uh, and the other thing I love looking at is uh, of course the Orion Nebula. Mm -hmm. So get out there quick, um, go early in the evening and you'll still see Orion setting. Mm -hmm. um, but so that's a really good one. If, if it's not the winter time and Orion's not up, then I start with the Big Dipper. And depending on what time of year it is, I show them all of the stuff that you can find using the Big Dipper as a pointer. Mm -hmm. Great. That's awesome. Um, let's see. Okay, last call for questions. Um, mm -hmm. I have a little bit of a, my last question is a little off the wall. Um, I, I also have worked, um, you know, quite a bit with kids, of course, being here at Mariah Mitchell and whatnot. And what I've learned over the years is kids ask the best questions. Yes. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you've had any really, you know, just fantastic questions from kids that have stuck in your mind. I'm sure you get them all the time. I'm wondering if there's any that have kind of blown you away a little bit or I don't know. Um, put you on a new sort of path of discovery of something you're like, I don't know, I have to go look that up or, you know. I, all of them. <laughs> so like, I just, I, because you get so many great questions and you get so many off the wall out there questions, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I'm always asked about aliens, if I believe in aliens, which I do. Um, but I want to point out to everyone that alien life, could be 
algae <laughs> right? and bacteria. There's all kinds of alien life that could be out there. So I always get asked uh, stuff about that. Um, I get asked lots and lots of black hole questions, um, which I have trouble answering <laughs> because that's not what I study. Um, and yeah, so, so, and then lots of questions about, about the different planets, mm -hmm. you know, and, oh, I always get asked if I would want to go out into space. And my answer is always no, mm -hmm. I would be too scared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's so many things that can go wrong. Yeah. You're in a tin can surrounded by space. Yeah. Also, yeah. I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is the ultimate height, I guess. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mason. <laughs> yeah, we Thanks have a, you. another couple of great talks and thank, thank you so God. much. And um, since we're a little bit past the time right now, I suppose we will um, just say thank you again so much. It's been such a great joy. Um, thank you for giving this talk. It was great to um, see you on Nantucket um, this last week when you were able to visit, which was fantastic. Please come back again. Um, I will try. And, and um, you know, the, your book is just so exciting and so fantastic. I'm looking forward to sh recommending it moving forward and sharing it with folks. And um, it is on sale at the uh, uh, the Mariah Mitchell Association gift store, and it is at the Nantucket Athenaeum. I checked. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, I actually saw it there. I was in there the other day and I saw it. They have it actually up on the shelf displayed so you can see it really big. So that's because yeah. I came in and said, hi. Oh, <laughs> that's great. Well, I saw it. So <laughs> that's great. That's really great. Well, thank you again. Thank you from all of us at Mariah Mitchell. It was a pure joy to have you back and um, I wish you all the best and um, we look forward to having you again in the future. And thank you to everyone who tuned in um, for our Winter Science Speaker Series. And if you missed anything or you'd like to rewatch um, any part of this talk, as I mentioned, we will be posting it on our YouTube channel um, tomorrow or the next day or so. So please feel free to um, go check it out there and share it with your friends. And um, we'll maybe see about getting up a list of recommended books somewhere on the MMA website, or at least a list that um, can direct to these other lists elsewhere where people compile lists of, of good book recommendations. So um, with that, I'll say th thank you so much, Meg. This was really, really fantastic. All right. Thank you so much for having me. And you're very, very welcome. I'll come anytime. <laughs> Great. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> right. Good night. <laughs>